Welcome to the Modern Cloister, where we cultivate deeper thinkers and worshipers through conversations at the intersection of church, culture, theology, and doxology, in the same spirit as the conversations that took place during the Reformation at the Black Cloister, the former monastery and home of Martin Luther and his wife, Katharina von Bora. If you like the types of conversations we've been having, we encourage you to rate, review, and subscribe. Connect with us on social media at Carissa Turner and the J. Kevin Turner, and send us your thoughts, questions, experiences, and suggestions for future topics to moderncloister at gmail.com. I'm Carissa, and we're so glad you've joined us for today's episode. I recently had the pleasure of hosting Hannah Nation for a conversation here in the Modern Cloister. Hannah is the Managing Director for the Center of House Church Theology and Content Director for China Partnership, and she's co-editor of a new book that was released earlier this year called Faith in the Wilderness, Words of Exhortation from the Chinese Church. This book is a collection of sermons and letters from Chinese Christians and pastors that beautifully showcase the pastoral heart and hope behind the House Church's remarkable faithfulness awakening its readers to the reality of the gospel and the ground of our hope in the midst of darkness. I personally found the book to be insightful, engaging, and deeply challenging, as the sermons reflect the ever-present reality of persecution and suffering of the Chinese church. It's also received several great accolades for what it offers, and I'll highlight just a few. Uh, Tim Keller said, let us learn from the witness of our Chinese brothers and sisters so that we can stand fast all the better as we face trials wherever we live. And Paul David Tripp said about the book, feed yourself on the riches here. You will be thankful that you did. It was really great having this time with Hannah and talking with her about both this book and the state of the church in China. We hope you enjoy the conversation. All right, Hannah, it's so great to have you on the show with us today. Thank you so much for joining us here in the Modern Cloister. Thank you so much for having me. All right, so let's talk about your new book. It's called Faith in the Wilderness, and I know our listeners are going to be really excited to hear all about this book, but before we dive into that, um, as I was stating in my intro, you have been uh, connected with the Chinese House Church, and so I'd love to just set the tone for this whole discussion how did you come to be involved with the Chinese house church? What's your story? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Um, so I, I really, I never grew up <laughs> with any ambition <laughs> to do what I do today. Um, I did live internationally as a child, um, in Europe and I have, uh, several family members, um, who are come from Asia. And so I would say I, I definitely grew up with an awareness of the global church and um, just life beyond American borders. Um, but I, I really didn't know anything about China specifically until college. And kind of two things converged. Um, my sophomore year in college, um, my dad is a physics professor and he had a grad student who was Chinese and, um, she began attending a Bible study in my parents' home and became a Christian that year. Um, so I knew her and interacted with her and her family. And then at the same time, um, there was a group of friends at college who had taught English in China for a summer and they came back and they were just super excited about it. Um, had had this amazing experience. So I kind of, um, randomly out of the blue decided that I also was going to go teach English <laughs> in China for a summer. And, um, I had a very holy motivation of wanting to see the great wall. <laughs> um, <laughs> Understandable. Yeah. <laughs> but the Lord really used that and used my curiosity. And I went and it just was a completely mind blowing experience mm -hmm. to engage this just massive culture. Um, you can't go to China and just be bowled over by how many people are there. And I think I was really, really struck by how much I had grown up, um, for 20 years without any real exposure to China knowledge of China. And it was just such a huge place. And, and I've just felt like, wow, um, 
it's clear that God is at work here. It's clear that this is kind of the next chapter of church history, you could say. And I haven't heard anything about it um, until now. So I came back and I, I would not say at any point that I kind of made it a career objective <laughs> or um, wouldn't even say until fairly recently that it, it felt like a really long-term calling, but essentially the Lord just kept um, bringing me further and further into increased engagement with the Chinese church. And I, I ended up living in China for a couple of years um, involved in ministry. And then I worked in the U S with Chinese international students for a long time. Um, but I've always loved to write and, and, um, feel like that's something the Lord has gifted me with. And, um, a few years ago made a transition out of basically individual, you know, campus relational ministry into, um, editing and writing and scholarship on behalf of the Chinese house churches. And yeah, I love it. Um, it's challenging and rewarding, um, and has had a huge impact on my own personal faith and just my understanding of the Lord and what he's doing in our world. That's fascinating. And it, I think it speaks to what you and I were just talking about right before we hit record to start this, the power of what seems like a small decision in the beginning that just begins this trajectory that can't be stopped yes. almost. And it sounds like that's yes. a lot of really what happened for you. And so here you are all these years later, um, living a life and pursuing a calling that you only had an inkling of in the beginning and the way that God nurtures that. That's really, that's really neat. So, but before we jump into the book, I'd love to know, so what exactly is your role with the, with the center for house church theology? Is that the, the name of the, the group? Yep. Did I say that correctly? Okay. Yes. So, so what are you doing there now? So, so connect the dots from where you started to, to what does that look like? Uh, and, yeah. and then we'll jump into the book. I promise. And just, a yeah. Yeah. So um, the Center for House Church Theology was just started a year ago. Um, I'm our managing director, and our mission is to share the riches of um, theological thought and preaching and um, basically what pastors and theologians within China, within the house churches, are writing and teaching to share that outside of China with the global church. So within the world of missions and global engagement, um, there's so much that has gone into China. Mm -hmm. um, we really feel like it is now time to give back, you could say in a sense that um, as much as there has been so much uh, serving China, equipping China, um, they have their own perspectives on things and um, they've, they have voices that are, are to be heard in our, our global community. And so we are focused on translating their, their work and publishing it and promoting it. Um, I would say right now our main focus is on the English speaking world. Um, but we definitely have a heart to expand beyond that to additional contexts. Um, we really believe that so many, so many cultural contexts would benefit from hearing um, just the, the wisdom, the theological wisdom of the Chinese house churches that, that we know and, and we are connected to. I love that. And I couldn't imagine a better segue into my next question, which goes right into the book. And again, the, the name of the book is Faith in the Wilderness, Words of Exhortation from the Chinese Church. And, and my question to you to get us started in that space is, what is the story behind the creation of this book? Or another way I like to ask the question is, why this book and why now? Yeah. So, um, well, it's a little bit of a long story. <laughs> so. We have time. You're good. <laughs> um, so I, I've worked for a long time to try to publish um, writing from China for the broader American market and context. Um, and it's been a complicated process. It's taken us a really long time to figure out how to do it and, and um, partners for that work. 
But um, basically at the beginning of 2020, um, there was a, a large conference or convention of um, Asian church leaders and a lot of uh, Chinese house church leaders uh, left China to attend this convention. It was held in Malaysia. And um, I was there. I, I was at that meeting um, working with uh, people from North America um, who were attending. <laughs> and um, basically, um, the Wuhan lockdown took place the week before this conference was supposed to begin. So this was January of 2020, the end of January of 2020. And um, as you can imagine, it, it was quite difficult for the Chinese attendees. And it was quite diff difficult for the, the organizers to figure out what to do. <laughs> um, but very quickly, it became clear that just a lot of people would not be able to leave China um, and attend this conference. So the leadership of the Chinese delegation decided to live stream the conference into China. Um, if you don't know a lot about China, um, the Chinese internet is one of the most highly regulated um, internet ecosystems of our world. Um, it's not open and free um, to just live stream whatever you want into it. So they were doing this at risk to themselves in a lot of ways. But um, they soon discovered that there were just tens of thousands of device logins across the country. And they, um, as the conference concluded, they basically decided that as the pandemic was breaking out, this was not a time to hide <laughs> or a time to um, slow down. This was a time to really lean into evangelism. And um, so they adopted this motto of let the light shine in the darkness. And they organized, they started to organize these preaching events to take a, take place across 2020, which kind of were done in the spirit of maybe like a, an old school, like tent revival or like evangelistic mm -hmm. meeting, but kind of reimagined for the modern digital okay. world that we live in. And yeah. so they would have these weekend long preaching sessions, um, wanting to preach the gospel evangelistically to those who have never heard it in the middle of this pandemic. And so um, basically when we heard about this, we just thought, wow, <laughs> this is probably going to be really, really good content. <laughs> um, and we asked if we could start translating. Um, so we would get recordings of these sermons and we would start transcribing and um translating. And basically, as I started to get all this content, I just thought, man, this is, this is just so good. And it's not just good for China. It's, it's powerful, um, beyond China. You know, my family and I went, had a pretty rough experience with the pandemic and endured a lot of loss ourselves through that. And it was blessing me and reassuring my faith. And so, um, it just seemed like such a great time <laughs> to help introduce something from halfway around the world um, to the American audience because we all went through this same experience. You know, we all went through the COVID nineteen pandemic, and it's a, a it's a meeting ground. It was a global event, and so um, it was a good time to help introduce the Chinese voice to. American readers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it, I mean, from, from having read the book, it was striking to hear different voices from the Chinese church, different sermons, because it, it's a collection of sermons really that ca they came out of this. Mm -hmm. They were all in the same general space. And so while some of it was newer, because I, you know, I, I don't live the Chinese church experience over here in America, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but 
reading it and hearing it through their eyes, but then also having to some degree a lived experience that was similar. It was like this great mm-hmm. equalizer, mm-hmm. but there was enough mm-hmm. there where it was, it was really impactful. And, mm-hmm. and I think it's a really, really neat work that came out of it. And I, and I, I love thinking that this, um, this crazy time, something that could have been, you know, the, the falling apart of this, of this initiative is actually the, the beginnings of something even bigger and mm-hmm. the boldness mm-hmm. that was shown by these, by these church leaders is just incredible. And I'm, I'm curious, um, as you were pulling this book together and serving as its editor and bringing in these sermons, as you were dreaming of what this would really be able to do and the way it might breathe life into different areas of, of the global church, what are some of the specific ways that, that you really see and hope that this book encourages and challenges both the mm. church and individual believers as they're reading it, as they're taking mm. these sermons and, and, and seeing how it works out in their own lives from the perspective of, of the Chinese church? Yeah. Well, one of the things that I remember as I was working on it was really hard for me to wrap my head around initially, um, but I think has become it's just once I felt like I could understand it, it's really changed how I think about a lot of things, um, is that they do this kind of funny switching back and forth between talking about persecution and talking about the pandemic, (laughs) almost in the same breath sometimes. And it made me realize how much, um, you know, in my context, and I think in the at least more recent um, Western theological heritage, we've really separated persecution out from our other conversations about suffering. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of have these, we treat them like two very different topics. We, we think about, you know, the suffering that might surround things like cancer or, um, divorce or, um, one pastor in the book talks about the loss of a child. Mm -hmm. Um, we, we kind of think about those things maybe on one side, and then we kind of think about topics like church state relationship and persecution Mm -hmm. and like cultural witness, like in a very different category, in a very different box. And I realized how much they hold those two things together. And I think the reason they're able to hold those things together is that they see how, um, as Christians, we follow a savior who suffered in this world. Um, Christ's life on this earth was marked by suffering and it was marked by many forms of suffering. Um, not just one form of suffering Christ suffered in many, many ways. And so, um, a lot of the pastors and leaders that we've translated, they frequently talk about how Christians, um, are called to suffer with Christ and that, um, we fill up the afflictions of Christ. And essentially they, they often reference the verse, which says the servant is not above the master and the student is not above the teacher. And so, if our master Christ in this life suffered, we can anticipate we will live that life with him. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's a really healthy way to think about the topic of persecution. Um, I think it kind of like demythologizes it (laughs) a little bit because I think, Mm -hmm. especially in a Western context where we haven't felt that type of persecution, we kind of, it's very easy for us to make the topic of persecution, this like really big thing that we, you know, we make these heroes in it and we kind of create these myths around it, but it also makes it very scary for us. And it gives us a lot of anxiety when the culture isn't happy with us, or we feel pressure from our broader culture. And I think what um, our Chinese brothers and sisters can say to us essentially is, this is no different from any other form of suffering you've already had to endure in your life. In all of these areas of life, Christ is asking you to lay down your life and follow him. Um, They're all connected. And um, one is not more scary (laughs) or overwhelming than the other. Um, And so I think 
think, you know, today there's, that's a message we need to hear. I think that's a message that ought to be very encouraging to us. I think Christians, um, for sure, in the American context, and I think in a lot of um, neighboring contexts in Europe, um, we feel a good deal of anxiety about the fact that um, we're entering a, a post-Christian world <laughs> and a post-Christian cultural reality. So I think um, it's not to be flippant about that reality, but to say we have like people, there are people in the world who are more experienced with that reality that we can learn from and glean from, and they, it blesses us to hear from them. Mm -hmm. I also think it can be encouraging to Christians, um, and other contexts of persecution. Um, one of the reasons we're really interested in going beyond the English language even is just knowing and having a heart for churches and, um, parts of Africa or parts of the Middle East where um, they also endure visible aggressive persecution. And mm -hmm. um, they also, I think, would benefit from not just hearing from the American church, <laughs> mm -hmm. who doesn't know what it's talking about on these topics, yeah. Yeah. Um, but hearing from the Chinese church, who really are our older brothers and sisters, in a sense, on this topic. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I like the, I like the phrase you just used our brothers and sisters, our older brothers and sisters in this topic. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like that, that thought that in, in a particular circumstance, people who have walked journeys that we have not, at least to the extent that, mm -hmm. um, that we have not, that they mm -hmm. can provide that sort of um, almost mentorship yep. of sorts. I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's our term these days. We, you know, we talk about mentors, but, but it's a sense of, of we've been here. We, we know the lay of the land and we know what it looks like to walk obediently and with boldness in the face of things that we do not live here. Yeah. And as you were talking, I couldn't help, um, but think about the ways in which I, I think at times in, in the Western church and in particular in the American cultural church, we, uh, we trivialize what it means to be persecuted. <laughs> And so, yes. I mean, if, yes. if nothing else, this book allows a broader picture of what real persecution feels like real deep systemic persecution looks like that is passed simply, you know, you can't call something a Christmas tree any longer, <laughs> you know, of the sort, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, well, and I think um, to kind of keep going on that, that question, I think one of the most important takeaways for me is that. Um, because of their theological understanding of suffering and suffering with Christ, it really shapes um, their response to persecution. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it, it's so clear in the book that um, they are very gracious in their response and they actively seek to love their enemies. And um, I, I mean, I, I have just, testimony after testimony of pastors who are arrested and their response is two things. One, well, now it's time for me to repent of my idols. Um, as I am in the car on my way to the police station and two, um, now it's time for me to preach the gospel who, to people who might never otherwise hear it, mm -hmm. the policemen, who are going to be questioning me and the prostitutes and the drug dealers that I'm going to be incarcerated with, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and I just think like, that's, that's a heart disposition towards your culture yeah. <laughs> that I would love to see us have more of that to, to be able to look at persecution. And again, like we're, we don't have persecution here. Like, let's just talk about cultural pressure. Like to be able to look at yeah. cultural pressure and not have it be a fearful thing, but to have it be a time where we repent of our idols and then lean into evangelism with yeah. those who maybe have no other ways to hear it. Mm -hmm. Like that's an incredible response to um, opposition to the Christian faith. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it makes me think about even, you know, in, in the Bible, in the early church that that persecution was followed by the church growing in numbers that yes. people, people want to go where something is worth being persecuted for. And so what, one of the things that I, as I was reading through, and I don't know if this was in, in some of the notes about the book or something, but, but one of the, the phrases that caught my eye early in the beginning was that 
if we want our churches here to experience revival, the way we talk about, we need revival in our, in our Western churches, that we need to look to those who are being revived and those who are being revived are communities around the world that are experiencing this. And they're growing like crazy because people see there's something here, (laughs) whereas you can walk into so many, um, not, not all, I mean, it's hard to generalize, but you can walk in and to, you know, to, to some churches here, and it doesn't feel like much is actually different from, mm-hmm. from the cultures mm-hmm. around us. And so it's mm-hmm. just, it's such a unique picture into that. And I, I would love to know, as we're talking about some of the stories that came out, was there a particular part of this process for you personally, as you were reading, as you were reading these sermons and taking in these stories and doing all that, was there a particular moment that you realized how much this project had impacted you and your own, your own understanding of that in your own journey? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to try not to get emotional. <laughs> no one's asked me that quite like that before. <laughs> um, okay. Well, we're, we're in uncharted territory. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I mentioned briefly, we had a pretty rough couple of years with the pandemic. Um, we essentially were, um, made homeless twice over. Um, and it was hard. (laughs) Um, we, we lost, um, yeah, we, we essentially lost two lives or kind of two communities. And, um, thankfully, uh, we have amazing extended family and, um, we were living with my in-laws for a year of the pandemic. And, one of the really amazing blessings from it was that, um, we were able to save money and work towards a down payment for our our first house. But we, we tried entering the housing market, right. When everyone else in America also tried entering the housing market. And so, um, we got caught up in all the crazy market, uh, just craziness that hit the news at the beginning of 2021. And I can very clearly remember, um, after, you know, uh, basically about after a year of a lot of loss in our life, being very angry at God (laughs) that we were now having, um, so many difficulties buying a house. And, um, it, I just remember really feeling like, you know, this is, this is owed me (laughs) in some way, like I've suffered enough. (laughs) And, um, but I was simultaneous to that working on this book and it was such a challenge to just my American idols of comfort. Um, it was very painful to give up that idol, Um, it made me realize how much giving up your idols is, it's not a fluffy thing. It's a generally a painful thing to give up your idols. And, um, I think I realized how much I was being confronted with the choice of hanging on to my idols and also hanging on to a lot of bitterness and anger or letting go of my idols and accepting, um, essentially what felt like protracted suffering. (laughs) Um, but just working through that personally while working on these words was very precious to me. Um, it really did impact my view of like my own very relatively small suffering in a really profound way, listening to, these brothers who have endured so much more than my problems of not being able to buy a house. (laughs) Um, just it, it was deeply convicting. It was deeply convicting. Um, and in the end, I feel like working on, on this was really the gift that I needed through that stage of, our experience of loss with the pandemic. And like you said, I think it, it helped me in a very small way, feel, um, some fellowship with them. Um, it helped me understand them better for sure. Um, it helped me understand what they were saying more, um, to have gone through 
a year and a half of loss. Um, so yeah, it's, I, I, I have definitely, I definitely had a very personal response to the book as I was working on it. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm glad to have asked you the question. Yeah. <laughs> It's good. Well, that, that's so real. And that's, you know, that's, that's what some of the power of, of these sermons can offer. I mean, I was, you know, I wasn't, as I was reading through it, walking through anything in an intense state, but I still at that same time would read the way in which they talked about suffer. I just haven't heard much like it yeah. in, in, in regular church life, you know, the, the illustrations and the depth and the kind of language and the openness and the rawness and the realness with which they talk about this caught me off guard. And it was, yeah. it's, it's so different than what you, what you receive out here in the general, you know, preaching diet that most, most of us get. And that, that's not to denigrate our own preaching because yeah. it, you know, we have a lot of, of really great aspects to our preaching, but it's just one that isn't quite as strong. And and so I can only imagine how much that that spoke, you know, to you in those moments and how how fantastic that that is the reality. And um, that's just that's wonderful. That's that's God's timing and providence there for sure in your life as you're working through all that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I appreciate you sharing. Um, I would I would love to know um, one of the things that that I'm curious about in these in these pastors that have all contributed to this book. Where are they right now? What is life like <laughs> for them? Uh past, you know, the, the immediacy of, of that time that you talked about in the beginning and the height of the pandemic and, and what are, what are their churches up to? What are they up to? And, and what is that like for them these days? It's a mixed bag. Um, some of them, some of them, uh, are undergoing, I, I would say active persecution today. Um, a few of them are heavily monitored. Um, one of the, the pastors in the book um, is essentially monitored 24 seven and um, has dealt with quite a lot of anxiety and, and stress in his life as a result. One of the pastors um, also has a policeman posted outside his apartment complex every day. Um, and his, you know, movement is fairly restricted and some of his church has undergone, um, I, I would call it violent attack. Um, all of those pastors have had interactions, um, of essentially being arrested, um, usually for a shorter period of time, maybe about 24 hours and then are released. A lot of them, several of them have been fined um, very large amounts of money. Um, so definitely some of those pastors are undergoing ongoing struggles and um, ongoing suffering in their lives. Um, some of them don't have that experience right now. Um, China's, it, the situation in China is very pocketed. Um, it really depends on where, where you are in the country, what the local situation is. And, um, you know, so some of the pastors, um, have significantly more flexibility and, um, leeway and are not under as much pressure. So, one of the one of the ongoing difficulties right now within China is 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 still regarding um, COVID nineteen. Mm -hmm. um, some of the areas of China, um, especially Shanghai, um, have had incredibly incredibly harsh lockdowns, um, and in those places, the churches have had to really just move fully into mercy ministry and taking care of, um, some very serious situations where it can be hard to access food, um, hard to be, um, caring for those who are weak <laughs> in your community. So I would say, um, the situation in China, you know, it's, 
it's relatively stable, but it, it is hard. <laughs> you know, it's, mm -hmm. um, it is a very difficult time in China, um, still today. And I, I don't think anyone who's involved with China really has any strong sense of what's to come or, um, what lies ahead. So, um, some of the churches that I know of have essentially broken back down into small group models um, and meet in individual homes. Some of the churches are still able to meet in relatively public locations, um, like a office building or a hotel, um, but it just depends. So we trust the Lord <laughs> and um, we pray for them regularly. Um, that's always the main thing that we ask of people is, is if you've read the book and you're inspired by it, we ask you to commit to pray, um, because they aren't heroes. <laughs> they're not superhuman and, um, they're people just like everyone else. And it's hard. Yeah. I can't help, but think about this like dual reality that as you're talking about how so many of them have been arrested or are in lockdowns or they're being monitored and their movements are being, you know, just observed at all times, that this is their, their, their reality where they are. But yet through this book, their words have this whole other life out in the world. Mm -hmm. And as you were talking about that, the, the difference and the opportunity that was so striking to think that they may be on lockdown, you know, their, their movements may be, um, restricted their voice may be restricted to the degree that it, you know it, it can be there but through this it's really been an opportunity for their their message the message of hope through the gospel is being spread and it's just mm -hmm. incredible mm -hmm. so that's uh that's really neat mm -hmm. to think about that given all that you just shared and the intense and ongoing difficulty and and this may actually be the answer to my my last question for you um and and that is if you were to say, what is the one thing that you hope Western readers will take from this book, what would it be? And if you already answered it, maybe think of another, that's <laughs> your second thing. <laughs> but if there's something that, that you haven't yet shared, that is really like your main hope that we would take away over here in reading this and allowing it to, to impact us, to shape us to all of those things, what would it be? I've been coming back recently a lot. Um, to just the fact that we don't need to be afraid, um, that yes, there are a lot of hard things in our culture right now, um, on all sides, you know, um, but we don't need to live in fear. Um, the church can and does endure, under great hardship, it has for its entire history. And it is today in most places of the world. And um, I think no one wants hardship. And I think it would be wrong to want <laughs> hardship. Um, but when it comes, and it will come, um, the, there's no reason to respond in fear. And I think that paying attention to the words of those who not only are enduring, but are seeing, you know, people come to Christ constantly. Um, it should give us all the hope and the encouragement that we need to realize we don't have to live in fear. Um, you know, I have a friend um, he came to the U S for his seminary degree. Mm -hmm. He returned to China, um, to plan a church right when the uptick of persecution really started again. And we had a lot of conversations about how much he was aware that he was counting the cost to return and to take his family back. They plant, they started their church plant, um, right when his city went into lockdown and he didn't know whether it, he could even plant a church. Um, they 
faithfully complied with any regulations that were in place. And a year later, they had a hundred people in their church plant and baptized 10 people. And I just think like, there's no reason, like God can't be stopped, <laughs> you know? And, that's amazing. Um, that yeah. That's... There, there's nothing, there's nothing at all that can stop the will of the Lord. And for that reason alone, Christians have never had a need to fear, you know? Um, so I think what we need most is to be living in the grace of the Lord and, and, um, doing what the church is called to do when, at any point, <laughs> you know, um, we don't need to do anything different today. We just need to follow Christ. Um, yeah, that's my, that'll be my takeaway for, for today. <laughs> Thank you. Well, and on, I mean, honestly, that was perfect. I don't think anything else needs to be said in this whole podcast. Uh, you just preached to us all. If I may say it so myself, that was, that was just fantastic. Um, I love it. That's a really, really, really good and right place, I think, to end this, this whole discussion, really. And so um, I would love to, to leave our listeners with uh, just a couple pieces of info on where they can buy the book, where they can find out more about the work you're doing um, and, and all of those things. So if you want to share just a, a little bit of that and then, and then we'll close out. Yeah. So the book is Faith in the Wilderness, um, Words of Exhortation from the Chinese Church. I'm Hannah Nation, N-A-T-I-O-N, like country. Um, and you can find the book, you can really find the book anywhere you normally buy books. So, um, it's available on Amazon. It's available on Christian book. It's available on Barnes and Noble, I think. Um, so wherever you usually go, you can find it there. Um, you can learn more about what we're doing at housechurchtheology.com. Um, I will say, we're still new. We have a lot coming down the road. Um, we have another book coming out in December already, um, and two more in the works. <laughs> so if you buy this book and you love it, um, I really encourage you to go to housechurchtheology.com and get on our mailing list. You can also find us on social media. We're on Instagram, um, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, just search for um, House Church Theology. I'm also on all of those platforms and you can find me, Hannah Nation, um, on social media as well. Awesome. Well, thank you. And for, all, and for all of our listeners who are also visual, we're going to put all of those links on our show notes so you can find them all easily as well. Um, I think if you pick up this book, I highly encourage all of our listeners to. It's fantastic. And I think it'll be well worth your time. I think you'll leave refreshed and encouraged and challenged in a way that a lot of things, um, it's just, it offers you something that a lot of things don't. So I encourage everyone to go do it. Hannah, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. It's been an absolute, absolute joy to have you with us and hopefully we'll have you on again soon. Yeah. Thank you. It's great to be here. <laughs> All right. That's it for our show guys. Thanks so much.